Welcome back to another Q&A episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. In today's episode, Greg and I field questions about how much time powerlifters should spend training for hypertrophy, how frequently to bulk, optimal rest periods for strength and hypertrophy, whether or not you need to be doing deadlifts or deadlift variations for physique-related goals, and much more. On a related note, we recently rolled out a new feature on the Stronger by Science website. We have extracted clips from all of our Q&A episodes and organized them by topic. So now you can quickly find in-depth answers to your training and nutrition related questions. To check it out, head over to strongerbyscience.com QA. If you'd like to submit new questions for a future Q&A episode, you can do that by going to tiny.cc slash SBSQA. As always, thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your host, Eric Trexler, and today I've got a special guest host, temporary guest host, named Greg Knuckles. Now, before we get into the questions today, an uh, interesting thing happened this morning. I was watching television. There's a, a program called College Game Day. They, they preview all of the uh, forthcoming college football games for the day. And in this week's episode, they did a special showcase on Boyd Epley. And uh, it was a nice little history lesson about strength and conditioning. Obviously, our audience ha- has a keen interest in strength and conditioning, um, sport performance, weightlifting. And so it was a cool little, uh, like I said, a little historical look at how it all got started. So little known story. Again, my source is that show. So credit where credit's due. Um For the longest time, people thought if you lift weights, you get bulky, you get slow, you can't perform sport at a high level. The Nebraska college football team uh, was playing Oklahoma in 1969. They got beat, they got beat bad, and they didn't feel good about it. And one of their coaches said, we should go hire this guy who says he can make us better through lifting weights. Um, The head coach was pretty hesitant, but they went ahead and made the hire. And and that the person they hired was Boyd Epley. So he was the first paid strength coach in college history, uh, went on to be a co-founder of the NSCA, National Strength and Conditioning Association. And uh, like I said, the head coach was skeptical at first. So their weight room was smaller than a three-car garage, basically had no equipment. And uh, Boyd's salary was $4 a day. And his uh, his, uh, staff was not paid for their time. The next year, they played Oklahoma again, had a huge win, and people started to take notice of what Nebraska was doing differently. Um, At that point, strength coaches kind of took off and became a trend in college football, and the rest is history. So, you know, these college football strength coaching jobs these days, you'll see guys making, I mean, well over, what, like $500,000 a year. It's kind of like the premier place to do strength and conditioning is, is high-level college football. And uh, if you've ever wondered why, I mean, it was pretty much, uh, at least in the States, pretty much where it got started. Yeah, and if you're wondering about inflation rate, because, you know, $4 a day in 1969, that was a while ago. Uh, that was prior to the high inflation of the 1970s. Uh, even accounting for inflation, Assuming he was coaching 365 days a year, which I think is probably a pretty big assumption, that's still less than 10 grand a year. Uh, so, like four dollars in 1969 would be about 27 bucks today. You look at, I mean, God, I, I don't know what Nebraska's strength coach makes now, but there's no way it's less than like 300 grand, right? Yeah, we, uh, Jamie, pull that up for us. <laughs> yeah, who, Jamie? I, I think I learned from Reddit is a male. Uh, that is something we got wrong in a prior episode. Still have not ever listened to a Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, but a lot of people come to us for their... I think a lot of people view us as journalists first and foremost. So when when we get it wrong... <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> when we get it wrong, we get back on, we make the correction. So Jamie, apparently a male. Yeah, so uh, as of this year, the head strength coach of Nebraska makes $400,000 a year. Yeah, and that that's uh which is as much as the president. <laughs> yeah. I, I believe. But the question is who does more important work? Well, considering Nebraska's record this year. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's get into some more uh, pertinent questions here. Um we've got two questions for Greg that are very related. So, um these come from oh boy. Uh, the first one is from Jolton Rast. Seems right. 
Uh, so Greg, in a good powerlifting program, how much time slash volume should be spent on hypertrophy work? And how should this change based on training experience and whether it's the on season or the off season? Now, the second question that's related is from Zach. He says, I want to look jacked. How do I know if I am strong enough to be messing around with bodybuilding style training and accessory work? Um, the, the general gist of the question being, when am I ready to graduate from focusing on you know, strict strength training with the compound lifts and start branching out into doing more bodybuilding type accessories? Yeah, so, so my opinion for both of these is kind of, as your training career training career progresses as a powerlifter, you probably need to do gradually less hypertrophy work. And then also as you're getting closer to a meet, you probably need to do less hypertrophy work. So in the case of Zach's question, um, sounds like he probably hasn't been training all that long and isn't all that strong yet. So doesn't know if he should be doing hypertrophy work yet or just purely focusing on strength. In his case, I think it's the opposite. I think if anything, he should be focused on hypertrophy work, um, trying to fill out his frame, and then strength should follow from that. Uh, or at least with a larger base of muscularity, it will then be easier to build more strength. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it also it also depends on the individual and what their goals are. Um, you know, some people are training in a powerlifting style just to hit the biggest squat bench deadlift they can or the highest Wilk score or the most IPF points possible. You know, other people want to be stronger, but they also have aesthetic goals as well. And if they could, you know, let's say total 1,500 pounds at 181 and be really competitive or total 1,500 pounds at 198 but just look more jacked but be less competitive in the process – they'd probably go with looking more jacked, even if that makes them less competitive. So, I mean, like, obviously the individual's goals factor in here as well. So if, like, being strong and also jacked is just a big motivator for you, do more hypertrophy work. If you're someone whose just main goal is strength and optimizing long-term strength development, then I kind of revert to my original answer. Um... You know, first few months in the gym, just practice the movements, get your motor patterns down. You will just naturally grow from exposing your body to a new stimulus. Then after that period, um, probably still not a bad idea to keep some heavy work in your training. But then for, you know, the next couple of years, you're probably going to get the most bang for your buck in the long term just by working on filling out your frame, doing more hypertrophy work. Uh, then once you've kind of settled into the weight class that seems like it's going to be appropriate for you in the long term or at least the next few years then and also like i mean hypertrophy slows down over time um if you're someone who mainly competes in bodybuilding and you've been at it for 10 years and it takes you three years of training to put on three solid pounds of muscle like that's still literally your entire sport it makes sense to make that investment if you're a power lifter and it's like, okay, I'm going to have to put the heavier, maybe slightly lower volume, higher intensity strength work on the back burner for three years to really dedicate myself to hypertrophy work to put two or three pounds of muscle on my frame. Like at that point, the, the trade-off doesn't make much sense. So, you know, I, I think you should kind of at least right off the bat get all of the hypertrophy that's going to come easily to you and then start focusing more specifically on strength. Um, and then second part of that question, depending if it's on or off season, it's going to kind of depend on how your meets are spaced out uh, to kind of determine whether you do have a true off season or not. But, you know, assuming you do have a true off season, if you are especially currently trying to fill out a weight class better or move up a weight class, that's your time to do hypertrophy work. Um Probably not a good idea to, you know, be doing your sets of 10 to 15 or whatever, four weeks out from a meet. So yeah, newer lifters overall, even if your focus is strength long-term, more hypertrophy work is probably going to behoove you. And then as you get closer to a meet and as training status increases and you, you know, find what weight class is probably going to be your home for the next few years, then uh, more specific strength work is, is probably going to be the way to go. Another aspect of the on-season, 
off season part of the question is, you know, sometimes in the off season, you might just need to give yourself a little break. Um, like, you know, I, I had trained like pretty specific powerlifting type stuff at certain stretches of time in, in my lifting career. And powerlifting stuff's different, man. Like bodybuilding has its challenges, particularly on the diet side. But I remember when I first got into powerlifting type training, that was specific. A lot of the big three, hard and heavy, a lot of sets. And I felt like I got hit by a bus. <laughs> like, honestly, I mean. Well, I, I mean, it's probably just because you were very much habituated to something else. Right. Be because for me, if I train like that, it's normal and I feel fine. But if I went to, like, if, if I went to the gym today and squatted, I don't know, like three fairly challenging sets of 10 to 12 reps, I would be destroyed tomorrow because that's not the type of training I am at all habituated to. Yeah. Even with your joints, like you, you don't notice less wear and tear on your joints when you do like some lighter loads for heavier or for, for higher reps. For me, it feels like more wear and tear on my joints. Like everything just oh, hurts man. constantly for weeks. Yeah. For, for whatever reason, uh, my joints really love heavy like singles, doubles, triples. But when I drop the weight and just do more reps, and, and I'm not saying that that's a generalizable thing. I think it's likely to be different for a lot of people. But yeah, for me, just as the sheer number of reps I do climbs up, unless it's with really, really light loads. So, you know, if, if I go... If I go out on the road right now and do a set of like 100 body weight walking lunges, that'll be fine. Um, but like fairly challenging sets of 10 plus squats, multiple sets, like no, my knees very rarely feel creaky, but that will make my knees feel creaky. So, I mean, I, I think it just varies person to person. Yeah, yeah, because my, my experience has been completely the opposite. But every now and then I'll have a client who's mostly strength focused. And there's just the general wear and tear of hard and heavy training for a long time, or just the staleness of being on a similar strength focused program for week after week after week after week. Sometimes there, I've found some benefit to saying, let's just for the next six weeks, let's just do like a very bodybuilding focused thing. We can still utilize that time effectively, but shift gears a little bit, give yourself a break, both physically and mentally from kind of the wear and tear. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, and, and just one other, I guess, final thing I would add is for, <laughs> well, for this question and really a lot of the questions we answer, there's kind of like a scientifically correct or like a quote unquote theoretically uh, optimal answer to the question. And then there's also just the practical answer to the question. And really, I mean, I think if you are consistent with your training and training relatively hard for 10, 15 years, you're going to get pretty big. You're going to get pretty strong. So, you know, if you're someone who does have strength goals, but you really just don't like doing specific powerlifting training for months on end, do less of it. Uh, in the short to moderate term, that's probably going to be a little bit less efficient for strength gains, especially if you've been in the game for for years at this point, but like, that's fine. Or if you're someone who's, who's mostly trying to get big, but you just really like heavy strength focused training, you're probably going to put on muscle a little bit slower than you would, uh, if you did more focused hypertrophy work, but you know, stick with it for years and you are going to put muscle on your frame. So, um, if, if doing something that is theoretically better uh, runs the risk of harming adherence and harming consistency. Like ultimately, if you just gravitate to the style of training you enjoy more, um, you will, you know, get the vast majority of the benefits you would have gotten. May take a little bit longer, but still gets you to to virtually the same place over time. All right. Uh, so question here for Trex from John Ship. There's a lot of bulking discussion on recent shows, most of it focused on the size of the caloric surplus. I'd be interested in hearing about practical recommendations regarding the frequency of bulks and cuts. How often is common, and is there a ceiling where it's no longer effective in terms of strength or even harmful over over a given time period, uh, I assume there, to, to stay in a bulk? 
Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about this uh, in the context of mini cuts, I think, you know, that idea of oscillating between bulking and cutting cycles and, and how frequently is too frequently. So this is a, a look at a similar question, but from the opposite perspective. So um, looking at essentially how, how often people should bulk and if there's some diminishing returns there. So first of all, I would um, push back a little bit against the idea of using bulking as a categorical variable, meaning you are either either bulking or not bulking. Um, I, I think it makes a lot more sense to say how big is the surplus because you, you can't really separate the duration of the bulk from the magnitude of the bulk, if that makes sense. So, you know, a bulk theoretically could be any particular time period, maybe a day when your energy intake exceeds your expenditure. But realistically, we're talking about how frequently, how long, and how large of a, of a magnitude should a bulk be. Um, so, so that's the first thing to keep in mind is that obviously if you're going really intense with the magnitude of the bulk and you have a huge ener energy surplus, that bulk should be shorter in duration. Um, and those types of bulks, bulks, because they come with a high risk of fat gain, they should probably be done fairly rarely. Now, if you're doing a much more modest approach to bulking, then that should last longer because the day-to-day the -day surplus is smaller. And those can probably be implemented either for longer durations of time or more frequently throughout the year because the, the short-term risk of gaining a lot of fat mass would, would be uh, minimized. But uh, the, at the heart of this question, I think there's two questions you have to ask yourself uh, before you kind of make a plan for bulking. And the two questions are, first of all, where are you going? And second of all, when do you need to get there? So exactly how big do you wish to get? And do we have a specific time frame for achieving that, that goal? Because the simplest approach would be YOBO. You only bulk once. You basically start your lifting career you bulk up until you have all the lean mass you'd ever want. Then you cut to the body fat you'd prefer to maintain long term. And now you're done. You've got your dream physique. You're in maintenance mode. You, you're, you're golden. You've got what you want. That would be the uh, theoretically simplest approach, but nobody's going to be happy with that because that takes some very serious long term investment. Um, you have to sacrifice a lot of short term goals and, and basically say, I'm going to start this process and maybe in five to six years, I'm going to be stoked with what I've got at the end. Now, the more likely approach um, is your first bulk that you do, your first dedicated bulk. The goal should be to bulk to the minimum lean body mass that you'd be happy with. Like this isn't my all time dream goal for lean body mass, but this is an amount of, of lean mass that I'd be very comfortable maintaining in the short term um, and then building from there. And, and, and that's assuming it's a somewhat reasonable number. Correct. I mean, if you're starting with 60 kilos of lean body mass and you're like, eh, minimum I'd really be happy with is like 90, then you, you might be in for some tough sledding. Right. Yeah. They, what normally happens is I'll have someone who comes to me as a potential client and they say, I want to have way more muscle and I also want to be leaner. Should I bulk first or cut first? And what I usually tell them is if we cut now from where you're at, because you're unhappy with the amount of lean mass you have in your mind, you're thinking, well, we'll finish the cut and we'll be ripped and then we'll start adding lean mass. But usually what happens is you cut and then you say, I'm not ripped. I'm skinny and I'm very unhappy. <laughs> so like usually people who do the cut first route are very unhappy at the end of that cut. Yeah. They, they have a idea in mind, like I'm going to look like, peak Bruce Lee and they just end up looking like the mechanic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they want to be a Batman Christian Bale, but they are the mechanic Christian Bale. <laughs> um, Oh man. But, but no, so, so talk about insane body transformations though. Cause he went from one of the Batman films to the mechanic to another Batman film to the fighter where he was similarly, you know, anemic to another Batman film like his body weight was fluctuating like I think about 80 pounds per film which is ridiculous yeah anyway carry on Wait. I'm just I'm just very impressed by 
how how good Christian Bale was at manipulating his body comp. Didn't he also play like a very frumpy Dick Cheney? Uh, he I, that was after the fact. He also played, but that's still a transformation, right? I think he it, got pretty. It, it, it was. He also played a pretty overweight character on American Hustle. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Those are the, the the transformations I love is when someone just completely intentionally lets themselves go for a role and you're like, nice. The, the one people forget about, and I'm blanking on the name of the film, um, is Stallone did that one time too. Like people always think of Stallone as, you know, the guy who's 70 years old and has been in shape constantly for the last 50 years. Um, but at one point, I think sometime in the mid 2000s, he, he played a film uh, where he was just like a local cop or something like that. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he he had a hard time acting the role because like the guy was supposed to feel kind of like dumpy and down on his luck. But like, you know, he's still Stallone. You can throw <laughs> baggy clothes on him, but he's still Sylvester Stallone. And he found that to play the role, he actually had to, you know, get out of shape for the first time in his entire adult life. And that let him act the role. And then, you know, six months later, he's fucking ripped again. Yeah. So basically what I'm getting at is I don't really look at bulking as like, I don't think there's a lot of inherent utility in telling someone how frequently to bulk. I I think that bulks should be intentional and they should have uh, specific endpoints in mind. And so what that means is instead of saying, I'm going to do a six month bulk every two years or something like that. When you approach your next bulk, it should be because right now you are maintaining less lean mass than you want. And so you want to change that. And what you would do is say, okay, well, I want to add this many pounds of lean mass. I'm comfortable with this much fat gain in the process. And I'd like to achieve it by this end point. And so that's how you basically determine how big your, uh, your surplus should be and how long it's going to take to get there. So uh, the, the idea of looking at it as, you know, bulking is a categorical variable that you either, you're either bulking or not bulking. I, I don't know if that's a particularly nuanced way to envision it. And more importantly, the how frequently you do it is really not, uh, it, how frequently really comes down to um, how comfortable you are um, with your current amount of lean mass. So, like I said, the, the most straightforward way to do it is just say, I'm going to build all the lean mass I'd ever want, and then I'll cut and be shredded, and then I'll be happy forever. But what we find in a lifting career is goals shift. And so you, you always thought that you wanted to, you know, be 180 pounds and you'd be thrilled. And then you get there and you're there for a while. And then you say, turns out I'd rather be 200 pounds. And, and then it's time to bulk again. So um, I, I would deter people from using kind of a calendar to determine their cut, cut and bulk cycles and rather make sure that those cuts and bulks are, are specifically tailored to goals um, and, and are done intentionally with very specific endpoints in mind. Um, I would say this to, to try to make it um, less theoretical and more actionable. Sometimes I see people who bulk and cut way too frequently. Um, so, so that's definitely a thing that can happen. And so what they'll do is they'll say, I'm going to bulk. And then they gain any amount of fat and they say, oh, too much. I'm going to cut. And then they, you know, cut and they say, I wish I was bigger. And then they bulk and cut and bulk and cut. I would say if you're going to bulk, you should plan it out such that you're never bulking for less than at the absolute bare minimum a month at a time. Uh, Because you you really do have to be realistic about how rapidly you could even potentially hope to add an appreciable amount of muscle tissue. I would say... Even if you're somebody who just wants a little tiny bump in their lean mass and you don't want to go, uh, you know, you're not trying to add really substantial amounts of lean mass, at least give yourself a month, set your surplus accordingly. But I feel like all too often you see people who are just constantly going back and forth between bulks and cuts, um, not because they're happy with how it's going, but because once they devote time and attention to one goal, they realize that they prefer the other goal instead. It's kind of like the grass is always greener on the other side. They start putting on some muscle and they're like, oh no, I want to be shredded instead. So at least dedicate yourself, if you're going to do a bulk, minimum one month in duration for almost all contexts. Um, I rarely make blanket statements like that, but if you set out there for a two-week bulk, I don't know what you're going to accomplish. 
Yeah, I mean, if you do put on lean mass, it's glycogen and water. Right. So the second part is, is there a ceiling where it's no longer effective or even harmful over a given time period? Um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so there will be some people who are eating in a surplus, but they are, for whatever reason, not not gaining the good kind of tissue like you want. And so that, that would be an, a, a place where it's no longer effective, uh, theoretically. Um, and I mean, if, if you're in a bulk, meaning you're eating a surplus and you're not gaining strength and not gaining muscle, then that would be a net negative thing in most contexts. Now you, you could be somebody who's way too lean and could use some additional fat. So that, that could still potentially, there could be some people who it makes sense to do that. But generally speaking, if you find yourself in a position where you don't want to gain fat, you're eating in a surplus, but you're not getting bigger or stronger, then that would mean that you probably need to do some structural changes to what you're doing. So really take a close look at your training and figure out, am I actually stimulating muscle growth effectively uh, on the training side of the equation rather than the eating side? Some people might just be at the limit of how far they're willing to go in, in terms of putting on lean mass. I mean, that's going to be a small percentage of the people listening to this, but um, not necessarily though, because that doesn't mean your genetic ceiling. It just means like Basically, you, you run into a spot where there are no longer things you're willing to do to make the qualitative and quantitative changes to your approach to actually make signif significant increases from there. So like if you're like, okay, well, this is as far as I'm, I'm going to get training four days a week for about an hour at a time, and I'm not willing to do more than that, and I'm not willing to restructure my training, you're pretty much where you're going to be with what you're willing to do. So absolutely, you can get to a point when you're bulking where it no longer makes sense. You're no longer increasing strength or size we talked about this in the past greg there are times where you're increasing strength but not muscle <laughs> that that yeah, happens yeah. with lifters so th that's why i say you know there could be some people who even though they're not putting on muscle anymore um it still makes sense because they're still getting stronger on that bulk for some reason like we, we've talked about it before we don't know the exact reason maybe it has to do with leverages um we don't know. We, we've talked about it. It vexes us. But for some people, putting on a little bit of fat does seem to boost their total a little bit. But in any case, yeah, absolutely there's a limit where, where it no longer is productive and in some cases can be counterproductive because you're not getting more muscular, you're not getting stronger, and theoretically certain indicators of your cardiometabolic health might be taking a little, a little hit. So um, an interesting note, like I said, we're, we're good, fair and balanced journalists here. We talked about dreamer bulks in the past on an episode and we got the origin wrong. I got the origin wrong. Apparently. I, I didn't know it either. Yeah. Apparently the word dreamer bulk, I always assumed it was because you're, you're under this whimsical idea that you're like, oh yeah, this is a really good bulk, but really you're dreaming, right? Like it's not. But, but it turns out that it is the confluence and intertwining of two of the better memes that ever came out of bodybuilding.com. Yeah, so so the person I guess there was a person whose bodybuilding.com name was Dreamer, right? And they embarked on an a really <laughs> audacious bulk. Um, they dared to go where no bulker had gone before and just a small proportion of the weight gained was lean mass is, is the general consensus. I think that's very fair to say. What's the other part? What's the other meme? Uh that is the individual from whom the frog tech memes came <laughs> which was so so that that's an old school meme if you've uh if you've only been in you know the the online resistance training space for i would say probably fewer than five years uh you may have not seen the uh the frog tech memes but they were uh they were spicy back in the day it may be worth googling yeah those pictures were hilarious um Okay, so moving on. Oh, and, and one other thing I'd like to clarify. The Stallone movie was called Copland, released, I believe, in 1997. So if you want to see the one time in his life Sylvester Stallone wasn't shredded, just Google Sylvester Stallone Copland. Did you see the movie? No. So also, in in the interest of full disclosure, I, I only know about this because I saw someone post about it on Facebook, and I believe it was Brian Cron. Um, so shout outs to Brian, uh, 
no, I have I have not seen the film. I am not by any means a Stallone aficionado. Fair enough. All right, so moving on, we've got, again, two similar questions that we kind of lump together here. Aiden has a question. Um, Aiden says, I've noticed that my lifts have gotten stronger. Uh, as my lifts have gotten stronger, my rest periods are becoming longer. Uh, what's the mechanism behind that? What can I do to help mitigate it? The second question is from Jared Means. And the question is, what does the literature say about rest time between sets for maximizing hypertrophy versus maximizing strength? Is it possible to take too much or too little time between sets? Okay, so to start with Aiden's question, uh, yeah, there's a pretty straightforward mechanism by which you would probably just naturally gravitate to longer rest intervals as you get stronger. And that is because the caloric cost and therefore the oxygen cost of exercise um, roughly scales with work rate. Work here being the physics definition. Um, so, you know, you have a distance component, a time component, and a force component. If, you know, a set of 10 takes roughly the same amount of time, or, you know, just the total, I guess the time component isn't that important because that's going to affect the rate, but not necessarily the total caloric cost. Anyway, um, but assuming your range of motion doesn't dramatically change, you're doing the same number of reps, but you're doing it with 50% more weight. The total oxygen cost of that set is going to be about 50% higher. Um, and so, you know, if you think about it, um, similarly to running, uh, if you run 200 meters pretty leisurely in a minute, that's going to be perfectly fine. Unless you're an elite 400 meter runner, if you run 400 meters in the same minute, that's going to be very, very tough. Uh, it's the exact same thing. You're covering twice as much distance. Your work rate has doubled. The caloric cost and oxygen cost have doubled. You're going to be a lot more tired from it. It's going to take you longer to recover from that exertion. So it's the exact same thing with lifting weights. As long as range of motion doesn't change, weight on the bar goes up, oxygen cost goes up, takes longer to recover from, it's just generally harder. So yeah, I mean, that makes all the sense in the world. Um, you can <laughs> you can see this in uh, in any gym you go to where there's a range of people um, kind of stratified by strength. If you see someone, it's, you know, maybe they've been lifting for six months. Uh, they kind of have their major motor patterns down, but they're by no means strong yet. Um, and you see them do a really, really hard set of 10 squats. So, you know, maybe their 10 rep max squat is 200 pounds. And you see them, you know, do, do the hardest set of 10 they've ever done with 200 pounds. They barely grind out the last rep. Uh, they're going to be tired afterwards. Certainly their muscles are going to be pumped. Uh, they're going to be breathing hard. Two or three minutes later, they're going to be fine. If, on the other hand, you see someone do a similarly challenging set of 10 squats with 600 pounds, even if they're in, you know, decent shape, maybe they also do some cardio outside the gym. They're not just like completely out of shape, but they do a set of 10 squats at 600 pounds and, you know, it's a similarly challenging set. They're going to be wrecked for 10 minutes uh, just because that's, <laughs> that's an absurdly... Uh, anaerobically taxing effort they just did. So, um, man, I, I did the math on this one time, or I had to make some extrapolation. So there was a study by Brown and colleagues in 1994 that calculated the oxygen cost of deadlifts. Um, and then that was kind of carried forward um, in an Escamilla study, I believe, in 2001, looking at the oxygen cost of sumo and conventional deadlifts. So if we make some assumptions like the the oxygen cost of squatting being similar to, to deadlifts, um, at least on like a per range of motion basis, I think I calculated one time that the total oxygen cost of a set of 10 squats with 600 pounds was like somewhere in the neighborhood of sprinting about 600 meters, give or take. Difference being, unless you're in incredibly good shape, Sprinting 600 meters is probably going to take a minute and a half or more. 
Um, and for most lifters, it's probably going to take two minutes or more. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you knock out that set of 10 squats, maybe in a minute tops. Uh, if you're, if you're really getting after the first couple of reps, maybe 30, 45 seconds. So, you know, you're, you're talking about the, a, a similar caloric cost to running almost half a mile, but you're doing it in under a minute. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, you're going to take a while to recover from that. Just the sheer anaerobic stress you put yourself under is absolutely insane at that point. Um, if you have never done a Wingate test, on one hand, I'd recommend you never do a Wingate test. They're fucking terrible. On the other hand, I would recommend you do a Wingate test if you're not a super strong person, so you can understand what it's like for a super strong person to do a high rep set of like squats or deadlifts. Um, because a Wingate test is essentially an anaerobic test involving a, a bike, a mechanically braked bike, where you sprint as hard as possible for 30 seconds and everyone is dead at the end of a Wingate test. That is that is a universal thing. Um, and so... One, one key consideration... People are thinking, oh, a bike sprint for 30 seconds, that works. Um, there's a loaded component. Right, right. Yeah. So, like I said, it's a mechanically braked bike. You can't just, you know, hop on a fan bike at your cr local CrossFit box or something and approximate it. Uh, you're you're going to need a cycle ergometer to pull it off. But anyway, like, the Wingate tests are terrible for everyone. No matter how good of shape you're in, you feel awful after a Wingate test. And if you're not a pretty strong person, doing a Wingate test is probably the only way you can really get an idea of how hard high rep training is for really strong people. Because that's the only way you're going to be able to induce like a similar level of anaerobic stress for yourself. So anyway, very long way of answering, the, uh, answering Aiden's question. Yes, it makes sense you're going to have to rest longer as you get stronger just because the oxygen cost of exercise goes up as weight on the bar goes up, assuming, you know, total displacement is the same. Um, so, yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. A quick uh, addition on the, the topic of Wingate. So Wingate's, even people that are really legit, strong, fit people, a Wingate will wreck you. For like minutes after you've done it like i i mean i think it probably wrecks you more if you're in better shape because like if your total anaerobic capacity is higher you can simply induce more anaerobic stress than you yeah. would be if you were in worse shape yeah in any case like a lot of times you'll you'll be in like an exercise science lab and some tough guy goes oh yeah i, yeah, I got this but it you will be wrecked for like minutes afterward and the reason I bring that up, if you ever see a study where they do a repeated Wingate test <laughs> and you see that these poor bastards did like four Wingates over like a four minute span or something. Yeah. It is frankly unethical. <laughs> like, I mean, I, if it weren't for the fact that there was consent given that very well may violate the eighth amendment. Yeah. It's like that. It's, that's the cruel and unusual punishment one, right? Yeah, yeah. When, when you look at a, at a test protocol and you're like, so our subjects did four wind gates, and you're like, what? <laughs> it's it's easy to look over if you don't know what a wind gate is. So I could be wrong about this. Um, so full disclosure here, I don't watch hockey. I know exceedingly little about it. I went to my first uh, live hockey game last week. It was a lot of fun. I may go back. But anyway, I don't know anything about the sport, but someone told me that for the hockey combine, you know, much like the NFL or NBA combine, uh, they have a combine for, for the hockey draft. And one of the aspects of that is repeated Wingate tests. Uh, I believe it's just two with maybe like a three or five minute rest. And they want to see how much performance, well, one, just how good performance is in the first one. And then two, how much it drops off to the second one. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 I don't know if the hockey combine is televised the same way the NFL combine is, but if it is, you should try to find video of it. I guarantee you all of those guys are going to walk away from their second of the two Wingate tests as if they're drunk and nearing death because it's terrible. For sure. Okay, so that's Aiden's question. Jared's was very similar. 
Uh, also asking about rest intervals, asking what does the literature say about rest times to maximize hypertrophy versus maximizing strength. So it's difficult to split out hypertrophy and strength here just because there aren't that many well-controlled studies that have looked at either of these two questions. And I think all of the ones that do exist measured both hypertrophy and strength um, and tended to have similar results. And also don't use exceptionally well-trained lifters. So I could very well see the, the answer being different for an untrained lifter versus, you know, someone who's, who's already a pretty high level lifter. Um, but anyway, with those caveats out of the way, there is, I, I think the general belief, uh, I think that's the correct way to word it here. Um, uh, but a general belief in the like quote unquote evidence-based fitness community that longer rest intervals are superior for both hypertrophy and strength. Um, that kind of runs counter to the, the at least like old school bro belief. And I actually think the belief that's still published in the NSCA and ACSM guidelines, uh, if not, they were at least like in the prior version of the guidelines, that ideal for hypertrophy at least was shorter rest intervals, I believe 60 to 90 seconds. Um, so anyway, the the reason that I think a lot of people in the, again, quote unquote, evidence-based fitness community believe that longer rest intervals are superior is uh, Brad Schoenfeld did a study a couple years ago um, comparing if memory serves 60 versus 150 seconds of rest per set. Um, but it, regardless, it was like a short versus a long uh, rest interval. And the short wasn't crazy short. It wasn't like 15 seconds. Um, okay. So it was one minute versus three minutes. I pulled it up. Um, and so in that study, the group with the longer rest intervals, the three minute rest intervals did get better results. Um, I believe in both hypertrophy and strength. And so like, I love Brad. He does good research. Um, one, and so this isn't a knock on Brad at all. It's it's more a knock of people who uh, consume science mostly via Facebook or Twitter. Um, when someone kind of within our community publishes a study, a lot of people just take that as gospel and don't really look to see what other research has been published in the area, uh, perhaps by researchers who aren't as well known and prolific on social media. So... I absolutely don't think there's anything wrong with Brad's study, but I think that's kind of the driving force behind people just assuming that longer rest intervals are, you know, better for everyone across the board. But there is other research in the area. So there was another study by Buresh, um, very similar to, to Brad's study and also had very similar results. Longer rest intervals were better than short inter rest intervals. Uh, however, there was also a study by Villanueva. Um, it used older subjects, but it also tested long versus short rest intervals. And in that study, the shorter rest intervals um, produced, I know for sure, more hypertrophy. I think larger strength gains as well. Um, but, you know, I'm not rereading a dozen studies before recording this podcast. Uh, but <laughs> basically, Schoenfeld and Baresh better with longer rest intervals. Villanueva, better with shorter rest intervals. Uh, there was a study by Fink um, testing high reps with short rest intervals against moderate reps with longer rest intervals, uh, and it found more hypertrophy with the high rep short rest intervals. Um, and based on what we know about hypertrophy with different, rest, different rep ranges, uh, the Fink study was testing sets of 20 against sets of 8. Theoretically, in a vacuum, those should produce similar hypertrophy. Um, and so, you know, that also leaned in favor of shorter rest intervals being better. And then another study by Fink and colleagues tested short and long rest intervals, 30 seconds versus 150 seconds, and found similar hypertrophy in both conditions. So essentially, you know, we have five studies in this body of literature, two lean in favor of longer rest intervals, two lean in favor of shorter, and then one's just kind of a toss up. Um, so I'm... At least as far as hypertrophy goes for like untrained or moderately trained lifters, I'm pretty agnostic 
uh, from a hypertrophy perspective. I'm not convinced of like the old school idea that shorter rest intervals are better. And I'm also not convinced of, I think, what is the, the more common current orthodoxy that longer rest intervals are better. Um, I think that that's kind of still an open question when it comes to hypertrophy. And I would say the same thing about strength for, again, untrained and moderately trained lifters. What I will say, though, is that just based on my experience, both as a reasonably strong person myself, uh, from training with a lot of strong people and coaching a lot of pretty strong people, is I do think that short rest intervals can absolutely become counterproductive um, with pretty well-trained, pretty strong folks if your main goal is strength development. Mostly just because, like, kind of building on the answer to Aiden's previous question, if you're pretty strong, uh, unless you're just doing super low rep sets, each set is going to have a high enough oxygen cost that if you want to perform, you know, even comparably well in your next set, it's going to take a reasonably long period of time to recover. That may not matter all that much for hypertrophy because ultimately, you know, you're, you're trying to get enough tension on the muscle. You're probably trying to induce some metabolic stress. If you're not fully recovered from the previous set, it may not make a tremendously big difference. But I do think that your actual performance in the gym does matter considerably for strength development. Um, and your performance is just going to fall off precipitously set to set to set uh, if you're reasonably strong and you keep your rest intervals really short. So anyway, pretty agnostic when it comes to hypertrophy. For strength, um, I do think longer rest intervals tend to be better. Um, and if I was just putting some numbers on that, for upper body exercise, uh, or kind of single joint exercise for any muscle group, I'd say minimum of about 90, 90 seconds to two minutes and probably around three minutes of rest per set. And if you're pretty strong and you're doing compound lower body training, I'd say probably five-ish minutes of rest between sets is what I'd recommend. And if you're quite strong and especially doing moderate to higher reps, maybe even longer than five minutes. Uh, again, if if your main goal here is strength development, those are those are my opinions, both kind of from the literature and just my own experience on the matter. I've got similar guidelines for my clients that I coach. So, like one aspect is you know what does the the research say is most optimal, and then another another consideration is just the practical application, and so. When I'm putting together a program for a client, I want to make sure we're getting the training volume in that we need and making sure that we're able to keep up with the intensity that's prescribed. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to be in the gym for like three hours a day because we also are like an accountant, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like, I, like it, it, it's got, there's got to be a trade off of like, to me, the, the practical question is how much rest do I need to make sure this, that it facilitates me being able to do the next set effectively without turning my workout into like a two and a half hour ordeal. And so a lot of times I'll tell my clients like, take as much time as you need. If you find that you're needing an exceptionally long amount of time, then we're probably doing too much or too heavy. Right. Yeah. But generally speaking, I say you're doing like an isolation exercise, hypertrophy kind of stuff, you know, lateral raises with dumbbells, take a minute you know, if, if a minute, two minutes, maybe. Right. But if, if you need more than two minutes to recover from dumbbell lateral raises, we got, we got a problem going on. Yeah. You know I mean? Like you, you probably need to hop on the elliptical. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then when it comes to, we're, we're doing our main primary compound for the day, our benching, our squatting, our deadlifting, take three minutes. If you need five minutes, take five, but, but definitely it depends on, uh, which, what exercise we're performing there. For sure. And another thing I would say is if time becomes a concern, um, feel free to do like, feel free to do supersets that make sense. So the, the two kinds of supersets that tend to be used in the literature are um, agonist supersets. So, you know, let's say bench press and dumbbell flies uh, and antagonist supersets. So, for example, like bench press and barbell rows. 
there are plenty of other options out there. And I think generally I would recommend another option, especially if you're doing full body training. So for example, if you're doing uh, bench and deadlift in the same workout, and you're also gonna do some tricep work for your bench, and you're also gonna do some hamstring work for your deadlift, what I'd recommend is doing something like start your workout with deadlifts and uh, tricep extensions, and then moving on to bench and hamstring curls. That could potentially be problematic if it's like your heaviest bench session of the week, um, and you are like specifically benching for strength development, uh, and you know, maybe the tricep pre fatigue could negatively affect your bench press performance, but you know, then you could just kind of shuffle accessories around through the week where, you know, if you were going to do bicep stuff on another day, uh, or like rear delt stuff on another day, you could just sub out your tricep work on that day with your bicep or rear delt work on the other day, and then have a workout where it's like, you know, deadlift and bicep curls supersetted. One, sounds like a fucking gnarly superset. Uh, two, that shouldn't negatively affect your subsequent bench training. And then move on and do bench and hamstring curls. You know, doing bicep curls between sets of deadlifts should not make it take substantially longer to recover between sets of deadlifts. But it still lets you get that work in that you otherwise would just have to do at the end and tack time onto your, to your uh, training. And same thing with the hamstring curls. That shouldn't negatively affect your ability to recover between sets of bench, but you know those are two exercises you can then do together instead of having to tack something else onto the end of your workout. So you know a setup like that could still allow you to rest adequately between sets of deadlifts and between sets of bench press, still get the same amount of work in, um, and just make things a little bit more efficient. I personally don't like doing that, but I also don't have a problem with being in the gym for two and a half, three hours. Uh, so yeah, if, if the, the amount of time you do train um, and have to train is a big concern for you, uh, supersets are your friend and just try to make those supersets make sense such that you know, you're mostly supersetting a compound lift with a single joint lift and the single joint lift you're doing isn't going to affect the compound lift you're currently doing or important compound lifts that are gonna come later in your workout. All right, so next question we have for Trex is from Matt. Um, <laughs> I'm just seeing this question now. Okay, so Matt asks, rank these sports in order of difficulty and competitiveness. Okay, here are the sports. Men's natural bodybuilding, men's natural classic physique, baseball, basketball, and football. I'm assuming football here is American football, uh, but maybe he also means soccer. Yeah, I'm going with the assumption that we're talking American football there. And this is an easy one, so I'm just going to be quick. Uh, baseball, number five. Um, you could very comfortably eat three hot dogs and drink a beer while playing a baseball game. So, number five. Basketball, number four, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I wrestled. And though in America, those happen during the same season, so you can't do both. So, I obviously have a bias toward wrestling and away from basketball. The other thing is basketball does not have specific rules that have been made to determine if someone was intentionally trying to give you brain damage, which brings me to number three, which is football. Very difficult sport. People are trying to harm you in very serious ways, um, but the stakes aren't that high, which leads me to number one and two. Uh, high stakes, high level of talent, enormous talent pool, classic physique, and natural bodybuilding, but which one is number one? Number one is bodybuilding. The main reason that natural bodybuilding just edges out classic physique for the number one spot is because with classic physique, you don't necessarily have to hate yourself quite as much as you get ready for stage. Uh, you got to get those last couple pounds off to do the bodybuilding class, and those last couple pounds are the absolute worst. You can put on the, uh, the briefs for classic bodybuilding, not have shredded glutes and still feel like a human being that isn't almost dead. Natural bodybuilding, you got to put on the posing trunks, the glutes come out, they have to be shredded. And honest to God, it, it is so hard to explain how much worse you feel going from like 98% done with prep to 100% done. Like those last couple pounds at the very edge 
or at the very end of your prep that take you from a classic physique level of conditioning to a natural bodybuilding level, it's it's so hard to explain exactly how terrible those last few pounds are. So for that reason, number one is natural bodybuilding, which makes sense when you think of all the money that gets dumped into the sport. Usually where there's a high level of competition difficulty, that's where the money goes. So natural bodybuilding, the most talent, the most difficulty, the highest stakes, and the number one sport. And in many ways, essentially the only sport. Okay, question for Greg from Ryan W. And Ryan is a tall person. He is six foot seven or approximately two meters for our friends that use the metric system. And Ryan's question is, um, his BMI has always put him on the high side of overweight at 250 pounds. And basically the root of his question is, is the BMI scale built for normal height people? Basically, is his height biasing his BMI and making it seem like he's more overweight than than he should be based on BMI? Yeah, so p- probably. Th- th- something you need to know about the BMI scale is it was developed in the 1830s by uh, Lambert Adolf Jacques Quetlet. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Anyway, Adolf Quetlet. That's how we're going to say his name on the show. So anyway, uh, his name's not that important. The most important thing is it was developed in the 1830s. And uh, when he was, you know, looking... <laughs> so it, it was developed based on dissected corpses. And based on the dissected corpses that he looked at, uh, and just kind of some knowledge of how humans scale as they get bigger. Uh, He was like, you know, uh, height or weight certainly doesn't scale one-to-one with height. Um, It it seems to be somewhere between second order and third order. So, you know, weight seems to scale with height squared or height cubed. Realistically, probably somewhere in between. If I had to pick an ideal number, it probably scales with height raised to the 2.5th power, um, but it seems to be maybe a little bit closer to 2 than 3. So for BMI, it's just going to be, you know, body mass in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. But even when it was developed, he was like, you know, 2.5 would probably be a little better. But like I said, the important thing, it was developed in the 1830s. Uh, not everyone had TI-89 graphing calculators back then. Uh, and certainly didn't have a calculator on their phone in their pocket at the time. And so uh, it was really easy to raise stuff to the second power, really easy to raise stuff to the third power, uh, a non-negligible computational challenge to raise something to the two and a half power. Um, So BMI was developed as, you know, mass divided by height to the second power, and that's what it is. But even when it was developed, it was known... Uh, it's probably not perfect. So the reason why this is relevant is the um, the, the impact of scaling height to the wrong, like with the wrong exponent, isn't going to matter all that much for people who are normal height, which is you know kind of for whom the formula was developed. But it's going to matter more and more for people who are either way way considerably shorter than average or way way considerably taller than average. So uh, to use the example of Ryan W. who asked this question, he's approximately 2 meters tall and approximately 115 kilograms. So if we plug that into the current BMI formula, uh, 115 divided by 2 squared, he comes out with a BMI of almost 29, 28.75. However, if we use... Uh, what was, you know, at the time believed to be a more appropriate exponent in which I believe current, like, like ongoing science has found is probably a better exponent of 2.5, like height raised to the power of 2.5 rather than 2. Um, his BMI then would be 20.3, which is normal. And so I, I think that... You say 20.3? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean... For someone two meters tall, that makes a that's a big difference. Um, so, so yeah, it, and I mean, if you've if you've ever seen someone who's six foot seven or two meters tall who weighs two hundred and fifty pounds or about one hundred and fifteen kilos, like that 
to my eye, is a healthy weight on that frame. Um, so anyway, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so at, at six at six seven two fifty, you are probably a, a perfectly healthy weight. And BMI is probably telling you you are heftier than it likely should be telling you based on the fact that BMI was developed at a time when computational power was severely limited. So they just developed a formula that worked well for people who are around average height. It probably cuts the other way for people who are considerably shorter than average. So one one thing which I guess is important um, is that like kind of normal body height is able to skew high much easier than it is able to skew short unless someone has dwarfism of some of some sort but you know kind of normal height for people goes all the way down to you know maybe five foot three for a woman on the shorter side of things but not an outlier by any by any stretch of the imagination up to about six two ish six three for men um, so you can skew higher than that pretty easily. Like there's a lot of people without developmental conditions who are six seven, six eight, six nine, all the way up to seven foot who don't maybe have gigantism. There aren't that many people who are like four foot five without some form of dwarfism. So it, it, it's probably not as extreme for really short people as it is for really really tall people. Um, but it probably does cut the other way as well, where there's you know some people who are four foot 11, five feet tall, that BMI says are normal weight who are maybe overweight. Um, but yeah, so it's just purely uh, purely a matter of the, the exponent not being perfect for the BMI formula. Works reasonably well for most people. Probably doesn't work great for super jacked people overall in general, but in terms of even general population, works much more poorly for people who are very, very tall and likely very, very short as well. I've got a slightly related, I wouldn't say rant, but I would say tangent. It is kind of wild when you think of the number of things that we still use and the reason we use them is because of computational limitations that no longer exist. For sure. But we haven't updated it, you know? So like, like BMI, we could do better, but we don't. Um, why does everybody use a p-value of 0.05? Well, because at a certain point, they had to print tables mm -hmm. of either 0 .0, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, or whatever, you know? That's why we had specified cutoffs and didn't just say, well, just report your p-value mm -hmm. as a continuous number. Well, we can very easily report exact p-values now, extremely easily, but we still treat it as a very, very, very rigid cutoff, mm -hmm. you know? Um... There was one other I had in mind. Oh, yeah, we, we talked about Bayesian statistics uh, a couple episodes ago. Got a lot of surprisingly positive feedback on that. I think so, I think people are trolling us. But, um, you know, like when, when you lay it out um, in terms of the, the general concept of what each approach is doing, Bayesian brings a lot to the table. Mm -hmm. But frequentist methods became like, the way to do it because the computation was a lot more straightforward before our computational capacities caught up. Um, but still, it's like once something is ingrained based on prior computational difficulties, it's very hard to get that inertia to budge. Yeah, I mean, as long as something works well enough under most contexts, uh, there's going to be a lot of inertia so, I mean, if if for some reason um, the human population had another explosion in height as the one that occurred during the like early and middle part of the 20th century and, you know, the average human height became six foot five, guarantee you we would get an update to the BMI formula pretty quickly. But for the time being, you know, it doesn't work great for a non-negligible amount of people, but it works, you know, pretty well for 90, 95% of people. So there's just not that much energy pushing for, for it to change. Um, similar with frequentist statistics, like they have issues, but like they seem to generally work well enough most of the time for most applications. So yeah, people just roll with them. Um, 
But yeah, and I mean, <laughs> of those examples, dog, like BMI is way more egregious than frequentist versus Bayesian statistics because, you know, you, you still kind of need to understand Bayesian statistics and like there's, it's not something that's like super straightforward, but like, you know, literally the only difference between the current BMI formula and what would probably be a better BMI formula is like when you type in divided by height squared, just add 0.5 to the end <laughs> of it. And, you know, that that that's going to take a quarter of a second on literally every calculator in the world. Um, but yeah, people just don't do it. Do you think if we started over, if we started fresh today and said, how are we going to do this data analysis thing? Do you still think we would lean toward frequentist over Bayesian if you ignored the the past history of using it so much? That's a good question. Um, I think we'd probably go Bayesian. I think we would too. Just because like a Bayes factor is so much more explicitly interpretable than a p-value is. Yeah. I, I think it would be... Um, just more like inherently appealing and understandable to people just learning about statistics. I agree. All right. Next question for Eric is from Lee Tyler. Uh, the question is, is completely eschewing the dead, the deadlift and all deadlift variations acceptable from a bodybuilding standpoint? Uh, and if so, if that's the direction you lean, can you justify your answer uh, so can you name a couple of accomplished bodybuilders who've reached their level without incorporating deadlifts into their training? Uh, and then he finishes the question, to what extent can I make up for deadlift gains with a bunch of other exercises targeting the posterior chain, forearms, and upper traps? So for example, good mornings, leg curls, lunges, shrugs, and farmer's walks. Yeah, so this is a good question. I think a lot of people have this question in mind, especially people who kind of dislike deadlift or you know it just doesn't suit them well you can absolutely uh, ditch the deadlift as a bodybuilder without question they uh, held my feet to the fire and asked for specifics I think there are so many bodybuilders that don't deadlift that it's almost hard to find them like there's not a lot of people who like write tell-all articles of like I admit it I'm a bodybuilder that doesn't deadlift but like I mean I, I grew up watching the bodybuilding videos on uh you know youtube or the different like muscle magazine websites i don't know if i ever saw a deadlift and, and one thing i'll add here just because i could see someone holding your feet to the fire about this is uh th they asked specifically in the question can you name a couple who have reached their level without incorporating deadlifts into their training so that could be construed as you know, well, maybe they did their dead, maybe they did deadlifts at some point and have now dropped them. But I, I think a, a fair response to that is if they drop deadlifts and all of the muscles deadlift trains, they have since been able to hypertrophy further, then I think one can logically infer that the deadlift wasn't necessary to get to that point. Yeah. I mean, if you can ditch it and maintain the same level of success. Then, or, or keep getting bigger or, or, or build upon that. Yeah. And keep getting bigger then it probably wasn't an absolutely irreplaceable cornerstone uh, of your program. Now I, I love deadlifting and, uh, I would say that the default approach would be, it, it, it does have a very useful place for many bodybuilders, but, but the question is theoretically, can you get by without it? And the answer to me is unequivocally yes. And I, I think there are many 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 high level bodybuilders out there that do not regularly deadlift or if they did deadlift during their initial years of of bodybuilding they have since uh ditched it and are still doing just fine without it so um definitely you can i mean i the problem is i i follow exercise science more than i follow bodybuilding so this is like my big glaring weak spot for Q and A's is like to, to try to keep up with who's doing what in the bodybuilding world. I have no idea. I read the research. I train people. I train myself. I don't really follow who's doing what across the country, but in any case, I mean, like I said, there's, there's just ample, ample numbers of, of bodybuilders out there that are not currently deadlifting that are still doing just fine. 
Now, powerlifting, you should deadlift because you they're going to make you do it. <laughs> so one way or another yeah they're, they're gonna make you do it unless you're a bench specialist exactly but at that point are you really a power lifter oh wow that's th- those are shots to fire on another day though <laughs> yeah so um but no but I, I mean because it's lumped in with you know bench and squat and everybody likes doing those i think a lot of people assume like well you have to do it if you're going to participate in any realm of strength or physique sport but no, you can get by as a bodybuilder without deadlifts just fine. Hamstring curl is a perfectly suitable hamstring developer, same as like a glute ham raise. Uh, hip thrusts are fantastic for glute development. You can also get uh, some glute development out of your squats, your lunges, different back extension variations, step ups, even the glute kickback machine, which honestly people hate on it. I don't know why. I think it's a pretty fine, like. If you're if you're going to use a machine for isolation purposes, not a bad machine at all. Um, all sorts of stuff you can do to help develop your lower back. Too many to name. If your lower back is resisting any degree of loading, you're you're doing essentially what you were doing with the deadlift. I mean, there's a million ways to do that. Rows and pull ups will give you plenty of back thickness. Shrugs, farmers walk for traps. Most people really don't need a lot of, or most people don't really need any direct forearm training especially in bodybuilding, I I would be shocked if any bodybuilding judge is factoring that in to their consideration. Maybe if it's like the 99th criteria for a tiebreaker. Um, but yeah, most bodybuilders are not doing direct forearm work, but there are a lot of people who want to have big forearms, which is totally understandable. It's cool having big forearms. Of course it is. So if you, if you want big forearms, but you don't want to deadlift, you can absolutely do wrist curls. They'll get you there. You know, so, so yeah, absolutely. The, the general premise is you can do all sorts of different variations to individually make up for what you've lost by ditching the deadlift. Now I will say deadlifts are awesome. And unless we cannot use deadlifts, I've got all my clients doing some, some form of a deadlift, whether it's an RDL or a single leg RDL with like a dumbbell or kettlebell or, you know, sumo conventional deadlift. I'm hitting all sorts of deadlift variations for me and my clients. Um, but every now and then you're going to get a client who we shouldn't be deadlifting because they've, they've got an injury history or something like that, or they just hate it. And they say, Eric, please don't make me deadlift. In that case, we just don't. We do all sorts of other stuff. We still get great development all the way down the posterior chain and we're just fine. But but the main benefit with a deadlift, the reason I do my default stance is to keep it in if we can is because it is efficient as hell. Um, rather than doing all these nine different ex- accessory exercises to hit this group and that group and the other, that's the beauty of the compound lifts. If, if we can just load up a technically sound heavy deadlift, we're going to be training everything on the backside of the body between their ears and their heels. And that's a pretty cool thing. Okay, question for Greg. This question concerns getting more sleep. On average, it's easy for me to get seven to eight hours of sleep per night. Uh, recently my training demands have increased dramatically. I've been trying to get more sleep per night, eight to nine hours or more, but I frequently run into an issue. Uh, my sleep quality seems to go down and I end up either waking up earlier or waking up more during the night, resulting in poorer sleep. I employ every protocol that I can think of uh, in terms of just general sleep hygiene stuff, uh, but I can't manage to sleep more. Is this indicative that I shouldn't be trying to force more sleep? And should just return to my normal sleep habits? Yeah, so th- this is a good question. And I think that, um, I think in the past, I may have just given the blanket recommendation of trying to get more sleep, um, maybe without providing enough nuance. But anyway, um, yeah, there there is kind of more going on here. So first things first. Uh, the reason that Bruce, the the asker here, might be wanting to get more sleep is that to this point, it seems like sleep extension is probably one of the best things people can do to support hard training and get more out of their training, make more progress. Should be noted, uh, this hasn't been tested in the context of like strength sports or resistance training yet. But the research that is out there that looks at a variety of different sports from tennis to basketball to swimming to I think there was even a recent study on like middle distance runners. um, 
all finds that taking pretty high level athletes. Uh, so most of these studies use uh, like D1 collegiate athletes. So people who are quite good athletes, um, having them go from their like habitual six to eight hours of sleep per night to nine plus or even 10 plus hours per night seems to result in pretty notable improvements in performance within reasonably short periods of time. So just like a couple weeks. And so if you're having issues recovering from training and you can sleep more, that's that's one of the first things I'd recommend. You know, making sure you're eating enough total calories and protein and making sure you're sleeping enough. Um, however, there are a few things to note about that. So as I mentioned, the vast majority of those studies, or I think maybe all of those studies, have used uh, collegiate athletes. I think the the recent one on runners may not have, um, but regardless, like most of those studies use high level collegiate athletes. One important thing to note about sleep is as the pineal gland ages, um, you release less melatonin through the night and sleep duration just naturally trends down. So children can very comfortably sleep nine to 10 hours per night. By the time someone's in their 70s or 80s, um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I know that like typical sleep durations drop off quite a bit just because they don't have as much melatonin to keep them asleep and sedated anymore. So, you know, sleep durations could drop from, you know, seven to eight hours a night for a typical adult down to, you know, five, six, seven hours a night for, um, like a septuagenarian, for example. So, in that could be relevant for um, you know looking at research on college athletes versus say a middle aged person who listens to this podcast. Very well could be possible for you know twenty one year old college athlete uh, who feels decent sleeping eight hours per day to start getting ten plus hours of sleep per night. But that very well may just not be possible even if you're not old, like even if you're thirty five, forty, forty five years old. At that point, your ability to rip off 10 hours of sleep in a clip may just not be there anymore because you probably do have some aging of your pineal gland. So the exact amount of time is, you know, I, I think important here. Um, if like, so like I said, 10 plus hours is used in some of the research, maybe eight to nine hours is sleep extension for a middle-aged person. Uh, we don't really have that research yet because, again, we don't have that many studies and most of them use pretty young athletes. Next thing I would say is that it can absolutely do more harm than good to just try to force yourself to get more sleep than you actually need. Um, just kind of on a practical level, that can stress you out. Sleep is supposed to be relaxing. If you think like, oh, I need to get this sleep and I can't get it, suddenly like you're kind of tired but you're still in bed, can't fall asleep. Like that, that happens to me all the time. So I wouldn't necessarily try to force getting more sleep and saying like, I have to sleep this period of time. And if I don't, it's bad. What I think I would generally recommend if you want to try a sleep extension strategy is trying to go to bed, uh, maybe like an hour earlier than you typically do. And to the best of your ability, just try to wake up without an alarm. Um, and so like, you know, it, let's say you have to wake up at seven every day to get to work by eight, eight thirty, whatever it is. Um, you know, if you're getting eight hours per night, maybe you're typically going to bed at 11 PM. If you move your bedtime forward to 10 PM and you're still waking up to that alarm at seven, like if that's still, you know, seemingly not as much sleep as your body wants, you know, maybe try moving your bedtime forward another 30 minutes or so. Um, but, but you know, I think that a good general rule of thumb is if you're able to wake up without an alarm, you're probably getting as much sleep as your body wants and needs. Um, and, and I would, I think, practically just, you know, try to get that from moving your bedtime forward slightly rather than saying, like, here's a fixed amount of sleep I have to get every night, and if I don't, it's bad. Uh, if you, you know... If you naturally wake up and you don't have to use an alarm after eight hours of sleep, 
I think that's probably a good general indication that that's as much sleep as your body needs. That's as much as it's craving. And I don't think, you know, stubbornly laying there for an hour and trying to force yourself to get another hour of sleep is really going to accomplish that much for you. Uh, Another thing that I'll note about the research as well is in addition to them being young athletes, they were also, I mean, D1 athletes are very, very serious athletes. So, you know, you say that your training demands have increased dramatically. That very well may be the case, but it also very well may be the case that you're still not, you know, putting in as much training and as hard of training as a D1 athlete would be. So, you know, whereas they may really benefit from getting an extra two hours of sleep per night because they are just training so hard, for you, you know, if you were training kind of comfortably before and now training demands have gone up quite a bit, maybe what would be like the optimal amount of sleep extension for you is 30 minutes or an hour, not a dramatic amount. Um, So anyway, I I feel like that was a little bit rambly, but just kind of to bring it all home, the total amount you're going to be able to sleep does vary person to person, but is, is pretty strongly dependent on age. If you're, you know, I would say probably more than 30, 35 years old, you're you're just going to find it really hard to sleep nine or more hours per night uh, in general. Um, the difficulty of your training probably matters pretty substantially here as well. In all likelihood, you may be training hard by your standards, but probably aren't training that hard by D1 athlete standards. So you may just simply not need the same degree of sleep extension they do. And just as a general rule of thumb, If you find yourself being able to wake up naturally without needing an alarm to wake you up, I think in general, assuming you don't have some sort of like sleep condition, you are probably getting about as much sleep as your body wants and needs. So that's, that's how I would answer that question. Do you have anything to add, Trex? No, I mean, I think we've all been there in those situations where you know that it would benefit you to be sleeping, but you're unable to sleep. And then you like stress yourself out and then you can't sleep because you're stressed because you wish you were sleeping. That's not a state that you want to put yourself into frequently. So if you're trying to force from, if you're trying to force yourself to go from a normal amount of sleep to a higher than normal amount of sleep and it's not working, I I really wouldn't spend a whole lot of time trying to force it, which is completely in line with what you've said. All right, then. So moving on to the next question for Eric from Josh VL. Are you ever concerned about a client having high creatine levels? My doctor mentioned that I should stop taking creatine because my levels were above the recommended levels. Uh, I disregarded the advice, but was curious on your take. Okay, so I'm assuming when you say high creatine levels, you mean high creatinine levels. Uh, So creatinine is a breakdown product of creatine, and under normal circumstances that... If your creatinine levels are higher than normal, that would be indicative of impaired kidney function. And uh, under normal circumstances, that would certainly be a problematic thing. And you would want to figure out the root cause uh, of why your kidney function seems to be impaired. Now, if you're consuming an abnormal amount of creatine, which, you know, if you take a creatine supplement, you are, um... I think normal, like typical dietary creatine intake in an omnivorous diet is probably like a gram or two a day at most, um, unless you're seeking out additional sources and really hitting it hard. Um, Uh, Unless you're one of the people who's super hardcore and you're on the raw carnivore diet. Right. Yes. And if that's the case, you can actually consume quite a bit of creatine. Okay. Uh, but for most typical diets, a gram, maybe two a day. So if you're taking a five gram scoop or, you know, loading creatine, yeah, your creatinine is going to go up and that's not necessarily indicative of anything to do with your kidney. It just means you put in a lot of the precursor, it got broken down and now you're eliminating the breakdown product. So what happens is, um, your doctor probably, I'm going to make a list of assumptions here that may or may not be true. Um, probably not from a lifting background or a sports medicine background where they took a keen interest in creatine, probably learned during med school, rightfully so, that under normal circumstances, a high creatinine value is a bad thing. And so when they see it, they probably say, hey, this is abnormal. Stop doing things that make it abnormal. 
But realistically, if you're taking creatine, it essentially makes the the plasma creatinine test an invalid test. You you have skewed the result of that test, and the outcome there is no longer uh, it no longer means what it used to because you've skewed it. Now, uh, <laughs> you know, and if you look at the different creatine studies over the years, they see high elevated creatinine levels all the time. And it's never resulted in anything catastrophic in those studies. And one thing just to note as well is uh, if you hear the same thing about ALT and AST uh, results, which are generally indicative of liver function, they're also they also tend to just be naturally elevated if you're doing strenuous resistance training as well. Yeah, I had a friend who um, sent me their their blood test results. Their their doctor was freaked out because their creatine kinase was abnormal. Their creatinine was abnormal, and both of those liver enzymes were abnormal. And the doctor was like, "Dude, you're essentially dying. There's something <laughs> you, you, you have. You have major multiple organ failure going on right now." <laughs> yeah. And I was like, "No, it, it looks like you just take creatine and you lift probably more than you should." You know, he he, he was he had some serious weight room ambition and was just he was training hard, but but it was still just normal responses to very heavy training and creatine intake. Um, but now that, that takes me to the actionable part of this. Let's say you're on creatine, you go to the doctor and the creatinine value is high. The appropriate way to handle that, in my opinion, and this is not medical advice, but if it were me, I would say, well, doctor, um, I am on creatine and I understand that that should elevate my creatinine levels beyond the normal range. However, it would make sense to follow up and do additional testing to make sure that I don't have impaired kidney function or, or let's use some other information that might tell us whether or not there could be an underlying kidney problem. So that, that's the thing is you don't want to assume always like, well, nope, surely there could never possibly be anything wrong, but you would want to be very uh, transparent with your doctor and say, this particular test is skewed by my dietary practices. Are there other ways we can maybe just do a follow-up to make sure everything's okay in terms of my kidney function. They, they, it should be pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do. Uh, but yeah, so it, a lot of times you'll see people who, you know, their creatine kinase is high, which is due to muscle damage from training. Their liver, liver enzymes are high, their, their creatinine is high, and their doctors freak out, and most of the time it's completely benign. Okay, Greg, question for you. Um, okay. <laughs> So, yeah, question for Greg from Trend Baloney. Uh, I heard Greg once say uh, th- that one reason he's never taken anabolic steroids is their potential impact on cognition, but I've never seen anyone else reference that as a side effect. Could Greg elaborate? I certainly can. So, um, yeah, w- one thing that I should throw out there just to start is most of the research actually on living humans and not cell culture, and and by most of it, I think I mean all of it, um, is just cross-sectional research. Uh, if (laughs) If you're a researcher and you think that, uh, you, you can give someone a chemical that's not going to treat some sort of disease, but it has the potential to, um, you know, kill brain cells and decrease cognitive function, the IRB is going to say, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. We're not going to sign off on that. So it's uh, it's not something you can necessarily do RCTs on. And so the best we have in humans is, uh, is cross-sectional research, which, you know, standard caveats apply, can't necessarily infer causation. Um, but what is out there, uh, and, and the thing that put this on my on my radar is a study by Bornebeck. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, the title it, for anyone who wants to Google this is Structural Brain Imaging of Long-Term Anabolic Androgenic Steroid Users and Non-Using Weightlifters. Um, this was published back in 2017. And essentially what they did in the study is they found... Uh, a group of um, steroid users and non-users who were quite similar on like the vast majority of of relevant like health behaviors and so- socio demographic factors that could impact you know brain health or cognitive function to 
you know, try to, to the greatest degree possible, isolate just the effect of um, anabolic steroids. And so what they found in this study is that um, the, so they looked at, at, they did brain scans to look at various brain structures, and some of the brain structures were smaller in the um, anabolic steroid users, one might want to assume that that means that those brain regions had atrophied. We can't necessarily assume that they had atrophied because, again, it wasn't a longitudinal study, uh, but that is kind of the implication there, um, including, so some of the the brain regions that were smaller included just total brain gray matter, which isn't great, and the cerebral cortex, which also isn't great. That's where uh, most of your conscious thought goes on. Um, and then uh, they also found in in the uh, steroid user groups, their measures of verbal IQ were lower as well. Um, and that particularly scares me because, you know, m most of my nine to five is I'm a writer. Uh, you know, I interpret science, I coach people, but ultimately how I make most of my money is, is writing about this stuff. Um, so, uh, if, if again, if these were longitudinal changes and not just, you know, some other factor explaining it, if my verbal IQ went down, that would be very bad for me, both per personally and professionally. Um, and so like, again, as I've said for like the eighth time now, cross-sectional study, all standard caveats apply. But it should also be noted that in terms of like cell culture and like mechanistic work, um, we know that, <laughs> for example, the the uh, person asking this, their their name, Trin Baloney, is a little ironic here because Trin has been found to be directly neurotoxic and just like androgens in general above a certain threshold also exhibit neurotoxicity. So there is a mechanism by which we we could assume that taking steroids does cause some of those negative changes in the brain longitudinally. Um, like I said, since it is cross-sectional research, another completely valid option here is that maybe just people at baseline with some of those differences in in like brain structure um, may have just naturally been more drawn to using steroids. So you know maybe it's that people with on average, less brain gray matter and smaller cerebral, cor cerebral cortexes are going to be more drawn to use steroids than people who don't. That's also, uh, and I don't, I don't intend that as a burn, by the way, uh, but that is something that is entirely possible as well. And given the fact that this is cross-sectional research, we can't rule it out. Um, so anyway, the the link between steroids in potential brain issues and cognitive issues is not as strong as say the link between steroids and balding or steroids and cratering uh, HDL levels. Like th those are things that we actually have longitudinal human evidence to support. So it's not something that's like as, as firmly established as those things, but there's enough going on here both in terms of cross-sectional research and mechanistic research, that it it concerns me enough to kind of scare me away from it. Um, now, like I said, so so trend itself seems to be directly neurotoxic, uh, even at, at relatively small concentrations. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if like kind of the idea of like YouTube natty doses. Uh, weren't necessarily all that bad. So, you know, maybe if you go on like slightly super physiological doses of just testosterone, but nothing crazy and not throwing in a bunch of accessories, I could very well, it would not be difficult to convince me that that's not going to have much of a negative effect on cognition or brain function or, or anything whatsoever. Like I, I would strongly assume that if this is like a causative thing, there is probably some sort of dose response relationship here with, you know, higher doses being more deleterious. Um, but I, I also know that I'm the person <laughs> that uh, if I do something, I don't do half measures. 
Uh, I kind of feel like if I ever went on gear, it would be like, ah, let's try a little bit. Let's get some more gains. Let's see how this goes. And in like 18 months, I'd just be on everything in the kitchen, <laughs> everything in the kitchen sink and like just become a meme on the steroid subreddit where it's just like, holy fuck, how's this guy taking so much? Like, like I know myself well enough to know that if I stick my toes in those waters, that is what I would do. Um, <laughs> and so... Uh, Anyway, those are my general thoughts. In terms of why it's not as well known, I think it's not as well known because uh, the research that's out is like pretty recent. So I think most of these things were found in the last five years or so, whereas the impact on like cardiovascular health or like hair and stuff like that, most of that was established 20, 30 years ago. So it's had longer to disseminate. And also, like I said, I'm not making any claims that we know for sure that these are longitudinal changes that happen. The The evidence is admittedly much more murky than it is for some of the other more well-known side effects of steroids. So I think that's one of the reasons, or probably the biggest reason you haven't seen many other people talking about it. It's less well-supported. It's less well-known. Um, but yeah, those are, I would say, my general thoughts on the on the topic. So I, I share that same character trait where like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to like go as far as I possibly can with it. Very dude, dude he here's what's going to happen. Listeners, you need to stay tuned to the Stronger by Science media empire for the next like 20 years. Because <laughs> one of these days, me and Trex are going to get old. We're going to go on HRT. Oh, yeah. And then two years after that, we're going to be the biggest fucking 65-year-old mass monsters you've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, so with, with natural bodybuilding, I've had periods of time where my T is low, like out of the normal reference range. It's horrible. I pretty much decided immediately when I had my first drop in test, I was like, oh, dude, when I hit that age, I'm going on <laughs> HRT. Uh, that's not a medical recommendation, but that's how I'm going to choose to live my life. But I, I, I really do believe that I'll probably like hang up my competition trunks I'll be old, I'll go on HRT, and then I'll probably, after my competitive career, achieve my peak physique at the age of, like, 63. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen uh, Have you seen those commercials for, I think it's just, like, an anti-aging clinic where it's basically just, you know, if you're old enough, we're going to give you all of the test and growth hormone you could ever want. And kind of the front man for it is this doctor who's, like, 70-plus years old and looks like an incredibly jacked Mr. Magoo. Never, never seen it. It's it's something worth Googling. Anyway, I could definitely see myself going that route as well. Oh, yeah. All right. So next question for Eric is from Wilma Larson. So Wilma says or asks, more and more studies show that a plant-based diet is healthier than one that includes meat and other animal products. How does this relate to uh, gains and weight loss? So, um, this is a topic that's been in the news lately. Obviously, last episode, we talked a little bit about a, a documentary called The Game Changers that talked about switching to plant-based diets. It talked about different um, health and performance-related outcomes and how they relate to either plant-based diets or omnivorous diets. So, first, I want to push back a little bit about the the premise of the question so it, it kind of says you know more and more studies show that a plant-based diet is healthier than one that includes meat i'm not ready to get on board with that premise um yet uh i think you could definitely say that there are many observational studies showing that people who tend to choose plant-based diets have better long-term health outcomes than people who don't but there's a very, very big confounding influence there of the fact that a lot of people who adopt plant-based diets tend to be pretty health-conscious individuals who have made a pretty serious commitment to making uh, health-related sacrifices. So can, can I just ask a question real quick just about definitions? Yeah. So it seems like both this question and your answer so far is assuming that plant-based diets is synonymous with the vegetarian and vegan diets mm -hmm. my understanding was that you could very much have an omnivorous plant-based diet where it's essentially you know you eat some meat you eat a bunch of plants you just cut out a lot of processed junk like 
like almost like a paleo diet where you just eat a ton of fruits and veggies. I wouldn't see a problem with operationalizing it that way because I'm not sure if there is a true singular definition of plant-based diet. But in this question, it it, comp- it creates a dichotomy of plant-based diet versus one that includes meat or other animal products. No, I, I got you. I, yeah. w- I was genuinely curious because I am not a participant in that discussion at all. <laughs> but I know I've seen plant-based diet as a term used to also describe like generally healthy omnivorous diets. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that was like a generally incorrect usage of that term or if this question was using it incorrectly. Like I'm, I'm just curious about what the kind of common definition is. The way I've seen it used lately in conversation, and I'm not tapped into the vegan vegetarian world either. So I don't know if, if there are competing definitions going around, but the interpretation I've seen most commonly recently is that a plant-based diet is vegetarian, if not vegan. Um, Fair but, enough. But I, I could see you saying, well, that's that's not necessarily what it should mean. But but we'll, based on the way the, the question is phrased, we'll just operationalize it that way going, you know, and, and move forward from there. That works. So, um, yeah, but like I said, um, a lot of times what those studies are accidentally or unintentionally doing is comparing what are the outcomes of very health focused individuals compared to people who aren't particularly health focused? And and obviously that's going to have big implications for their exercise habits, whether or not they smoke, how often and how much they drink alcohol, a whole host of, of health related behavior. So, um, I, I, I'm not ready to say that unequivocally a diet that excludes animal products is more healthy than a, a diet that includes some animal products. Um, now if you gravitate toward a plant-based diet or, or a vegan diet, we'll say, um, just to be more specific, there are many, many justifiable reasons to do that. So, you know, I I definitely don't want people to think I'm anti-vegan diets. Um, there are very defensible ethical reasons to do it, whether they pertain to the welfare of animals or different environmental reasons. I'm an expert in neither of those areas, so... Not, I'm, I'm not going to further that conversation in any way, but it's, it's very defensible and understandable. Some people also find that when they gravitate toward a vegan diet, like I said, once they buy in to making more health-related sacrifices or decisions, um, it has an effect on other health-related decisions they make. So when they stick to their vegan diet, they eat more vegetables, more fiber, they eat less, you know, objectively crappy foods uh you know they eat less foods that cause them to overeat or increase their likelihood of overeating that are hyper palatable um foods that have extremely high energy density so some people it makes sense because they adopt the vegan diet and they adopt a whole like category of positive health related behaviors and that's totally fine and you you can make a vegan diet work extremely well you can be a fantastic athlete on a vegan diet but I, I push back against against the idea that there is a, an unequivocal categorical nutritional advantage to a vegan diet compared to an omnivorous diet. Um, so directly to the question, it should have no bearing on weight gain or weight loss. Um, really what we're looking at there is making sure your total energy intake is appropriate for your weight gain or your weight loss goal and making sure that your macronutrient uh, proportions are, are, are suitable as well. Now, if the macronutrient intakes are matched between a vegan diet and a, an omnivorous diet, you should expect that the results in terms of performance and body composition would be either neutral, you know, no benefit either way, or they might slightly favor the omnivorous diet due to issues related to protein quality. Um, however, if you just made small adjustments to account for that difference in protein quality, and you made sure that within your vegan diet, you were getting adequate intake of all the key essential amino acids that you need, then any small benefit to the omnivorous diet would probably disappear. So you can set up two equally awesome diets, whether they're vegan or omnivorous, um, whether your goal is to gain muscle or to lose fat. And then of course, if it's vegetarian and not vegan, it at that point becomes super easy. Oh yeah. Because you have plenty of high 
quality protein sources at your disposal. Absolutely. Anything egg-based, anything dairy-based, you've got all or, all sorts of options there. So that, that's why I use vegan as the extreme example. That's the one that you have to actually get a little bit more creative. But dude, for a while, I honestly got, I probably spent about two, probably two years or so, essentially as an ovo-lacto-vegetarian, which basically means I'll eat egg products, eat dairy products, uh, but no meat or fish. The only reason was because I was too lazy to cook meat and fish. <laughs> Honestly. No, I mean, I, I've been there as well. Like, I like, love, I, I like eggs in the morning. And then if I'm super busy and don't feel like cooking anything or just like straight up dog, I eat a lot of meat. And sometimes I just get tired of it and just don't want to eat meat for like a week. Yep. And uh, it, I used to eat a lot of cottage cheese and yogurt. And recently I've really been into skier. And like, I'll just eat quarts of skier a day. And I'm perfectly happy with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for a while there, it was whey protein, Greek yogurt and eggs. And I was totally content. It was just because I was lazy. And when you're like a college student and you share a kitchen with six 19 year old guys, essentially every time you cook, you're risking your life. There are (laughs) all sorts of bacteria in that kitchen, some of which probably haven't been identified by modern science. Um so yeah, I just didn't cook much. Um, okay, so just to so I, I think I've answered the question itself pretty directly. I'd like to use an example here to clarify my views on plant-based versus omnivorous diets. So it is a hundred percent possible to have an omnivorous diet that is totally full of nutrient dense plants and phytochemicals. You have some animal products in there, but you know the ba- the bulk of your diet, you've got all sorts of vegetables and fruits, a variety of intakes. That is an excellent high quality diet. Um, it's totally possible to have an insanely terrible plant-based diet that has no animal products. It's not that hard. Just think of any shitty junk food that doesn't have animal products in it. Eat all of that. Congratulations, you're the least healthy vegan on the planet. I mean, so I, I know uh, I know several vegan powerlifters, and uh, a couple of them do have really good, high quality diets. But kind of the running joke among the rest of them is just like a vegan powerlifting diet is tofu, veganaise, and Oreos. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that. That is abs- First of all, disgusting. Second of all, not an ideal diet to facilitate (laughs) your performance and body comp. But so this idea of treating them as categorical and one is better than the other, it doesn't make a lot of sense. A diet has a lot of components that are, uh, that are all important and you got to make sure whether it's vegan or omnivorous, you've got all your bases covered. Um, so if you told me, you know, what I'm going to do is reduce my intake of processed meats lower my animal fat intake, and I'm going to replace some of those choices with fibrous vegetables because currently I don't eat any of them. You've made good substitutions. These are objectively good substitutions to make, assuming all other things are equal. If you're going from a a diet that's super high in processed fatty animal products and you had no vegetables previously and you're making that type of swap, of course, that's a step up. You're doing a good thing based on everything we know about nutrition. If you were on a good, like well put together Mediterranean type diet, and you told me that you're going to swap out your fish or your poultry and put in tofu instead, I don't see that as a as a particularly beneficial swap. So there there are times where people adopt these types of like, oh, I'm going to do this like more plant based switch. Sometimes it is an objective improvement in the diet. Sometimes it's totally negligible. So with this and, and last week talking about that documentary, I think I've said everything I ever hope to say about vegan and vegetarian diets. Okay, so last question uh, for Greg. This one is from Jack Quint. I was wondering if you guys could provide any advice for students that are looking to improve their writing skills for science-based fitness articles. Related to that, what would be a useful approach for getting published on well-known websites? And I just want to mention, that's a really well-written question. I, it I, is, yeah. I very boldly was like, I'm going to read this one verbatim. Usually we can't. So you, you, Jack, you're already a very good question writer. Congratulations on that. That is true. Um, so I'll give you some advice here. And, and this is advice coming from me and kind of the route that I took. 
Um, I, I will say that it's it's probably different depending on what background you're coming from. So for example, uh, I know quite a few people who do have an academic background. They were used to writing a lot for journal publications, and then they tried to get into writing fitness articles for a lay audience. And you know their struggles with trying to develop more of like a lay press friendly voice we're very different from mine just trying to figure out how to write period because <laughs> um, I, I got into this before I had really any meaningful writing skills um, but anyway so some of some of the things that helped me out quite a bit were one just just practicing um, I don't really do this anymore but when I was first you know kind of like I'm putting my thoughts out there in the world People seem to kind of enjoy my writing. Uh, I want more people to read it, and so I want to get better at this. One of the things I did for a long time is I just had a rule where I wrote a thousand words a day. Didn't matter if they were good words, didn't matter if they were bad words. Most of them never saw the light of day. Um, but just simply putting pen to paper and trying to write something that is at least decent. Uh, it's the same way you would go about practicing a sport, same way you'd go, you'd go about practicing technique for the big three in the gym. You want to get better at something, practice helps quite a bit. Um, so then moving beyond just pure practice and just putting words on a page uh, is you want to try to make that practice purposeful and worthwhile. And so one of the things that helps tremendously with that is to get an editor. Um you, so th I was pretty fortunate here. Um, my wife, she worked professionally as a copy editor. Her background is in journalism. Uh, when I needed someone to tell me all of the ways in which I sucked tremendously as a writer, she was there for that. Um, Do you think people should hire an editor or just marry one? Ideally marry one, but yeah. hire one if you must. Yeah. So one of the things I was going to say is like, if you're just trying to get started as a writer and you're not currently making money at it, um, it may be kind of hard to justify hiring an editor. And I totally get that. Um, but, you know, you, you may be able to do like a quid pro quo of sorts with a buddy of yours who is a proficient writer or editor of some sort. Um, you know, maybe you know, you do programming for them and they do, and they like edit your writing for you and give you pointers or whatever. Um, but ju just trying to develop a relationship with an editor in some way, shape or form, I think will help a lot because I think all of us, I think all of us kind of know good writing when we see it and we know really bad writing when we see it. But unless you're uh, unless you're someone who has like a writing background or like a English grammar background and assuming you're trying to write in English, uh, it, it's hard to, it's hard to really distinguish the two. It, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like watching a film. Like you get out of a movie and you're like, oh, I liked that movie or I didn't like that movie. And maybe you can pick up on some stuff like, oh, some of those acting performances were really bad or like, oh, some of those explosions looked really fake or whatever. Uh, but you're probably not going to be able to pick up on the subtleties of it that like a professional film critic might be able to. I think writing is very similar. There are people who, you know, critically appraise writing professionally and they're going to be better at that than you are. And they're simply just going to understand the way the language works better than you do. So an editor will help you just both perf get better at the mechanics of writing. So, you know, word choice, punctuation, uh, sentence structure, how your paragraphs flow together. And then also kind of the more like artistic and stylistic uh, aspects of writing. So like, you know, how is your stuff structured? Are you developing arguments well, etc. cetera? Um, you know, you can, you can certainly figure all of that stuff out on your own, but if you know someone who does that professionally and has a better grasp on it than you do, that'll help a lot. And also, you're just getting another set of eyes on it and another set of critical eyes. Uh, it, it's it's hard to objectively evaluate 
really just your own work period, but especially your own writing, or at least I've found. So, you know, once you've practiced, once you've got an editor to help you out with some stuff, another thing that's very useful is just to run articles by your friends who are in your target demographic, just to make sure that A, they make sense, and B, they resonate. So an article could be well-written technically, but maybe just completely go over the heads of the people you want to read it and enjoy it. Or it may be way too basic, and they're like, oh, this seems to be well-written, but I know all of this shit already. Why are you wasting my time? Um, so there's kind of like, there's a process of, tr of figuring out like a level to pitch your articles at that it's going to be useful and relevant for the people you want it to be useful and relevant for, but it's not going to go over too many heads. Um, and just making sure you put that in the hands of the people who you want to read and like it to see if they actually enjoy reading it and getting something and get something out of it, uh, I think is, is a pretty big step as well. Um, then like the, at any given point in this process, another thing I'd recommend is just putting your work out there in the world. So you're getting targeted feedback from an editor. You're getting targeted feedback from friends in your target demographic. And then something that helps and will also help tear your ego down a little bit is just putting your work out into the world, publishing it on a blog, and getting feedback and criticism from the masses. Uh, some of it's going to be useful. Some of it's not going to be useful. Um, but I find, or at least I found for myself, that... When I went from knowing that, whatever, I can just put this out on the web and no one will see it to, oh shit, people are going to see this and if it fucking sucks, I'm going to hear about it. Just that kind of added level of accountability helped to make me a much better writer <laughs> um, because I knew that, you know, initially the stakes were very low, but there were at least stakes. Um, so I, I think that that's an important aspect as well. Um and then I would say once you kind of get a handle on the writing process, you kind of get a handle on your writing voice, um, I would say another thing that helps a lot is like just not publishing stuff just to publish stuff. Uh, one of the things you'll notice if you go back through the Stronger by Science archives is as time has gone on, we've published stuff less and less frequently. Part of that is just because like I've had less and less to say. I'm not the type of person who wants to write the same article half a dozen times just so I have a fresh version on, of it on the site to drive clicks. Like when I've said what I want to say, I'd much rather just kind of go back and edit an old article instead of write a completely new one on literally the exact same topic. Um, so, that, so that's part of it. But then also like I only publish something when I feel like I have something that's worthwhile to say and add to the conversation and also something that is my best work, um, or at least quite good work. And so like, I, I think one trap that a lot of people fall in that kind of stymies their development as a writer is like, they are writing a lot and they are putting reps in, but they're not purposefully trying to make those reps better. So like, to this day, I still write way more than I publish. Like I would say maybe one out of every six words that I write actually gets put on the website in some way, shape, or form. Um, so, you know, just generally taking pride in your work and trying to make your next article better than your last one. Like, like I would say as a general rule of thumb, if you look back on stuff you wrote two years ago, two years ago and don't just hate it, you're, you're probably not doing it right. And I mean, if, if you've been writing for 10 years and it's like, oh, I'm 12 years into the process now and the stuff I wrote 10 years into the process is still pretty good, then that's fine. But if you're just starting out, the stuff you wrote when you'd been writing for a year, if you don't hate that at the point when you've been writing for three years, you probably that probably doesn't mean the stuff you wrote when you were a year in was great. It probably means you haven't improved that much in the intervening two years. Um, so just as kind of a check. If you look back on old stuff and you're not kind of like, oh, this kind of sucks compared to my current stuff, I think that's a generally bad sign. Um, okay, so then the second part of that question is how to go about getting published on well-known websites. And uh, <laughs> first piece of advice, which uh, apparently doesn't occur to a lot of people, is 
like ask. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people are hoping that, you know, they put stuff on a blog and an editor of a big website is just going to peruse their blog one day and say, oh, this person's good. I should email them and get them to write for my big website. And like that can happen, but that's incredibly rare. Um, most of the writing gigs I've gotten is just like, you know, I read a website. I like a website. I'm like, I wish my work was on this website. And uh, I pitch something. Like you have to take initiative uh, if you're going to to get on a lot of big websites. So in terms of how to make that go as smoothly as possible is one, check out their style guidelines. Most big websites have style guidelines. And if you don't see it on the website and you can't find it via Googling, email the editor or like whoever you would be pitching articles to and say, hey, do you have style guidelines I could take a peek at? Like, I can almost guarantee you if, like, we have style guidelines. Uh, I don't think literally anyone ever looks at them. But if uh, if someone wanted to submit a, a guest article and they emailed me first and said, hey, could you send me your style guidelines? I promise you th that person would have a much larger chance of me eventually accepting the article. Because what you want to do is you want to make the, the editor's life as easy as possible. They're probably reviewing a lot of guest article submissions they, they're probably a busy person. You want to make their life as easy as possible. So one, if they have style guidelines, whatever drafts you submit, submit them already like tailored to style guidelines. Uh, then um, in the initial interaction, if assuming you could already find the style guidelines, what you want to do is you want to pitch article ideas to the site you want to ask for make sure that those article ideas make sense for the site. So like, for example, if you wanted to write for T Nation and you have a draft ready about bodybuilding and you have a draft ready about yoga, you probably don't want to pitch the yoga idea to T Nation. Like you'd probably want to pitch the bodybuilding idea. Um, so, you know, pitch things that you already have drafts ready for and based on what you pitch, demonstrate that you understand what the website is what type of articles they publish and who their audience is. You don't have to just like write out, oh, here's what you're about. Here's what your audience is. But like it should be pretty clear from the pitch that you understand what that site is and what it's about. Um, and then, you know, like I said, make sure you have a draft ready. And make sure that that draft is already within the style guidelines. So if, if someone says like, hey, I have an idea for an article. Would you be interested in seeing a draft? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. That sounds cool. And then I don't hear back from the person for like a month and they say, oh, here's the draft. Then I'm already kind of peeved because like one, that tells me that that wasn't a high priority for them, which I don't know if I'm justified in being peeved because, you know, they probably do have more important things going on. But as an editor, you want to feel like your site is important to the people writing for it. Um, so yeah, have a draft ready to go if they say I'd like to see a draft. Have a draft that you can go ahead and shoot over. Like I said, make sure it's in the site style guidelines already. And just ultimately at every step in the process, just ask yourself, am I making the editor's life easier or harder? And if the answer is harder, don't fucking do it. Because ultimately, whether or not you get to write for, for the site depends on whether the editor likes you and your content. If they don't like you, they're probably not going to like your content. So just make the editor's life easy. Yeah, the thing I would add, because um, all that stuff's good, the thing I would add is for a lot of people, there's um, a lot of people are a little bit nervous about putting their stuff out for the first time on a relatively big platform because most people don't like to have their work criticized. Um, some people are more sensitive to it than others, but nobody likes it. Um, but the thing I always remind myself if I ever get that feeling of like, Ugh, what if people hate it? That's just part of the game. Like it, it, my whole thing is if you don't want your work or your words to be criticized, keep them to yourself. But then once you put something out there, you have to accept that some people are going to maybe dislike it, maybe hate it. And that's just part of the, the cost of admission when you get into the game of publishing anything. 
And so that's the way it goes. You put your information out there, whether it's written or audio or whatever the case may be. Some people are going to think you're an idiot. And nowadays they'll just tell you like the internet's good for that. That's fine. It's the, the important thing is try to learn from it. Um, being able to take feedback objectively and say like, wow, three people told me this thing. Maybe there's something to it and actually implement that. Implementing feedback without getting defensive, without getting upset that that's really a huge key. Like you, you talked about growing as a writer and definitely I look back at things I wrote a long time ago and they suck and I hate them. But, um, the only way you get there is if along the way you solicit feedback, but more importantly, you accept it, you implement it thoughtfully and you continue to work on those skills. I agree. So one thing I would like to add in closing uh, is you have made it to the end of yet another Q&A episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. If you enjoy the Q&A episodes, or if you haven't listened through all of them yet, or if you just want to go back and listen to the greatest hits and get our hot takes about certain subjects, we now have pages on the website, which are an archive of our Q&As and the topics we've covered on the podcast, where you can you know, just control F in the page, uh, search for certain topics, certain questions. We have them categorized as well. Um, and you can, and it'll take you to a page where it takes you to the timestamp where we address that question or topic on the podcast. Uh, so it just makes, you know, kind of navigating our library a lot easier than if, you know, you know, we've discussed something before you want to listen back on it, or you're trying to make your way through the archives and, you know, you don't necessarily want to listen to every single second of the podcast up to this point to get caught up. And you just are more interested in certain topics than others, like whatever the, whatever the issue may be. Uh, you can go to strongerbyscience.com slash QA, and it's going to pull up a page called Q&A Database. And from there, you can, you know, find all of the questions we fielded and all of the topics we have discussed on the podcast just to uh, work your way through our archives more efficiently or to, uh, as it were, relive the hits. So again, that is strongerbyscience.com slash QA. Awesome. Now there is one final question this week. Gil620 asks, when will Greg become a permanent accepted host of your show? Um, permanent is a long time. So... We're not ready to go quite there, but I am happy to announce that I've extended an offer to bring uh, Greg as a special guest co-host for episode number 26 of the podcast. That'll be airing one week to, from today. As you guys know, episodes go up every single Thursday. Thanks again, as always, for listening, and we will talk to you in a week. Thanks for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. Now, Greg and I are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter. So before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits, make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, visit strongerbyscience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.